I don't care that you guys like me or want me or whatever. I am still Walter's daughter. Why should I have to put an application in to be a member of a band that I belong to from right from birth? I never really knew my culture. We don't throw our family away. We don't, we don't exclude. This is my land, and I want my land back. Membership. And go. It means different things to different people. Remember, hang on. Sometimes it gives you a sense of identity. But for one mother in Alberta, it could do much more. What I wanted was a relationship with my family. And I knew that if I pursued band membership, that I wouldn't get a relationship. <laughs> Taken in the 60s scoop, Deborah Sarah Finchin was raised in a non-Indigenous family. She always longed for a sense of belonging. You go to a family reunion or you go any place and you hear a lot of, oh, she looks just like her dad, oh, she looks just like her mother. I know Deb looks like nobody. <laughs> in the mid-90s, she traced her roots to the Saw Ridge First Nation in northern Alberta. It's an exclusive band. According to Indigenous Services Canada, there are just 42 on-reserve members and over 400 live off-reserve. Sawridge is famous in Alberta for its hotel chain and for the lucrative oil rights it owns. But Deborah didn't know this yet. Something else mattered more. When I did finally meet some of my family, all I heard was, oh my God, she looks just like her father. There was still a part of me going, yes, I finally looked like somebody. <laughs> I finally belonged to somebody. <laughs> so, um... Sarah Finchin has a strong claim to Sawridge membership. She is the daughter of the late Chief Walter Twin. My aunt had asked me, she said, do you know who your father is? And she said, it's Walter Twin. And she was all excited and I went, yeah, okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> And uh, because I had no idea at that point in time who he was. Walter Twin led the Sawridge Nation for decades. He was chief in 1966 when oil was discovered on Sawridge land. With royalties from the nation's oil and gas development, those famous Sawridge hotels were built across Alberta. And the band's income began to roll in. Twin was also appointed to the Senate in 1990. Catherine Twin is his widow. She spoke to APTN Investigates in summer of 2019. I married Walter in 1984 and shortly after our marriage one day we're driving in the truck and he liked to drive in the bush and clear his head and that's what we would do. But on this day, he had a confession for her. He said to me, I have a baby girl out there. And I asked him, tell me more. Um, and he didn't know what had become of her. He collapsed and died at a sweat lodge ceremony in 1997. We'd made arrangements to be, he said he had to be in Edmonton for a court case. And then he phoned me that day and he says, this took longer than I thought. I have to be here for one of the boys. And I went, okay. And he says, we'll do it in the next week or two. And then he died. So I didn't actually get to meet him face to face. One year after Twin died, Catherine made contact with Deborah. 
I met her at her home in Edmonton and I drove up and um, she was waiting for me on her front porch and she was sitting in a wheelchair and she was a spitting image of Walter and I burst into tears and that was the beginning of our relationship. She's Walter's daughter. She's my stepdaughter. She's my daughter too. And he's not here anymore. And you know, we don't throw our family away. We acknowledge our family. We have relationships, positive, constructive, supportive, loving relationships with our family and we support one another. We don't, we don't exclude. Twin herself might not exclude, but when Sarah Finchin tried to become a member of this very wealthy band, she found a mountain of red tape that was almost impossible to climb. Sawridge First Nation declined an on-camera interview, but sent this letter saying in part, the First Nation wishes to ensure that new members will contribute positively to the First Nation and not create undue hardship on the First Nation. As such, the membership application forms are quite detailed and the review of the applications is done very carefully. The membership review process may also include other steps such as interviews. Membership is generally only granted to a small number of people at any one time. Applying to become a member here is rigorous. As this eight-page form shows, there are more than 100 questions about genealogy, financial situations, criminal and driver's records, and even health conditions. The application states if any information is found to be false or misleading, this shall be sufficient grounds for the denial of an application. So without a recognized family history, and even with the help of her stepmother Catherine Twin, there was no way Sarah Finchin could be accepted to a band that there was no doubt she belonged to. The thing is, She's not alone in trying. Back in the day, they had a 42 application page that asked me about my great, great, great grandmother and asked me questions on how much she smoked, if she had STDs, how many husbands she had, things that I could not answer. I actually grew up with my granny in, in, uh, on the Saw Ridge land before we were taken away. I miss out a lot on the fact that I have, I, I never really knew my culture. I never had a, a, a identified with it at all. I don't know how to speak Cree. I was never taught. I don't know how to do the cultural things like off the reserve. I can't hunt, I can't fish. My goal is to be able to, like, you know, hopefully gain membership um, and be able to become um, like an active member of my community. APTN Investigates spoke with many others who were denied membership. All have similar stories and all were helped by Catherine Twin. We'll have more on her fight when we come back. Next on Investigates. My dad is a full member to Sorge First Nation. My dad should be on that ban list. All of us kids should be on that ban list. My parents married in 1976. Why should I have to put an application in to be a member of a band that I belong to from right from birth? She's not gonna, like, we're not gonna give up. You know, we're just gonna keep fighting until we get an, or the right answer. And that's, you know, and the right answer is welcome, you know, to the band. always told we're not allowed to go on the Sorge First Nation. There's um, signs put up, no trespassing. And if we do go on Sorge First Nation, 
that we would we could be fined. Sawridge is three hours north of Edmonton, right on the shores of Slave Lake. But I would love to go on and let my my bare foot touch the soil that I believe is part of me that's lost. APTN investigates followed Angie Ward and her family here, the land she says her ancestors once lived on. Today we are going on the First Nation, Sorge First Nation, for the very first time as a family. They should have allowed us in, onto the reserve. I'm on the ban list of 93 and now it, my name has all of a sudden disappeared. And I would like to know the reasons why. I'm not on the ban list and the reasons why I'm not on this worst ban. We're going in and we're going in barefooted. This will be the first time in our life that we've ever touched the soil that belongs to us. Got my grandkids here who suffer from not having the same services that I have for medical education. This is the first time ever we've touched the soil of Sorge First Nation. It feels good. I have ancestors from 1800s that were here before me. This is my land and I want my land back. In order for us to heal from what we've been through, I think a part of it is being knowing where you come from because my dad was residentially raised, right? He was ripped out of the, the nation, I believe, probably when he was about five or six years old. Coming back and having children of his own, and trying to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of healing. I think he felt that part of that in getting his membership. I think that's uh, a lost soul in us, that we don't know who we really are and where we come from. Twenty third, nineteen twenty one, place of birth. My Muslim was born on Sorge First Nation. Angie Ward's late father, Frank Joseph Ward, grew up on the Sorge First Nation. During the residential school era, he was taken away. In nineteen seventy one, he began fighting for Sorge membership, but he was never successful. Ward believes it's her birthright. A ban may not create barriers to membership for those persons who are by law already deemed to be members. My dad is a full member to Sorge First Nation. My dad should be on that ban list. All of us kids should be on that ban list. My parents married in 1976. His mother enfranchised in 1945. My dad was born in 1942, October 28, 1942. My dad was born to a woman that was full treaty which should make him still full treaty to that ban list. He should not have had to fight for his rights to be a ban member. And we should not have to fight for our rights to be who we are today. Why should I have to put an application in to be a member of a ban that I belong to from right from birth? Peter Cardinal is Angie Ward's uncle. He says finding the paperwork required to prove genealogy is a struggle. We have to do a family tree. And so for some reason that someone, a lot of people, whether it's their lawyers or, or the system, doesn't, won't, won't uh, believe anything as to say, 
Yes, I am Clara's sister. Yes, I am Frank's brother. He has been fighting for band membership since he was taken away to residential school. She's not going to, like, we're not going to give up. You know, we're just going to keep fighting till we get an, or the right answer. And that's, you know, and the right answer is welcome, you know, to the band. Band member Catherine Twin helped Ward get her genealogy together to prove her right as a member. But for Twin, the struggle is personal and has legal implications. While Catherine's husband, Walter Twin, was chief, Saurich created two trust funds. These funds controlled the income from their oil rights and hotel business. According to this affidavit from Saurage's trust administrator, Paul Bujold, the Saurage trusts were worth approximately $140 million in 2015. Catherine Twin was a trustee until she resigned in 2018. I am bound by a confidentiality and settlement agreement with the trustees and there's some things I can talk about and there's other things I cannot talk about and if I breach that boundary I'm very concerned that there will be retaliation. Catherine did not discuss many details with us but several Alberta court documents available to the public can help tell us her story. According to these court documents, she had been trying to get recognition for multiple members who were beneficiaries in 1985. In this court filing, she lays out her argument. There has not been an independent legal determination for the beneficiaries of the 1985 trust or a process put into place to make this determination. She also alleges that elected band council members and elders who are also trustees of the trust are allowing their political or personal agenda to influence their decision making as trustees. We're living in a very, very disconnected world. It's a very dark world. And we can stay in that darkness or we can follow the light. Deborah and I have followed the light. And I feel really blessed to have her in my life and for my sons to know their sister. Because we are family. That's the gift. I don't care that you guys like me or want me or whatever. I am still Walter's daughter. You guys did not have to fight for this. You just got it handed to you. And not that I wanted handed it to me, but it's part of my heritage too. What do you get and not me? What do your children get and not mine? Being part of the band meant that I was part of the family, part of a community, that I belonged somewhere, that there was a heritage there that I didn't know anything about and wanted to learn. It's very important to me that my children have that sense of community that they They belong somewhere. Everybody needs to belong somewhere. Sorry. Next week on APTN Investigates. There have been people who had honestly been waiting decades for their application to go through. Uh, so not surprising to me, um, but again, a little kind of disheartening. They're not here for us, they're people. I tell my grandkids, I'm alive, I'm here. 
We're still walking the face of the earth. If they wanted to go to court just to prove where you kids come from, I could do that. I can do that. I would I would push for that. Instead of having all this paperwork at where nobody looks at it. I would push to go to court and stand by, by my grandkids. The people who are left in the dark or left outside and, and who don't have membership but believe they have a strong claim towards it will have to take their own government, their own, their own community to court. I hate to say it, but I'm not holding up much hope. I think I've got like that much chance of getting it completed. We're doing to each other now what the Indian Act did for so long. We know for sure there are people who have issues with not being properly recognized and saying, well, you can go to our court system. You can hire somebody at, at an outrageous cost and your community can hire somebody else at an equally outrageous cost. And when it's over, the issue of this member or other people in similar situations might not even be resolved. Membership cannot be hijacked by political forces.